Welcome to this third part of the CSS lecture and um, we have now talked all about the style in CSS and how things are, how individual elements are styled. Uh, we'll go now into positioning of elements. Um, and the first thing to start off with is the CSS box model, which is an important thing to understand uh, in order to see how things are layouted, how they're rendered on the browser screen. So when a browser renders HTML, when it draws it, what it does is it draws a box around each element. You have already seen that when I, for example, uh, gave a background color to a diff or to a text element, you, you saw that it was basically a rectangular box uh, and that's exactly what HTML does. Um, you have the content area itself. So if you, for example, have a paragraph, that's just the area of your text. Um, but then there are optional areas around it and you need to understand these in order to do the right layouting. The first thing you add uh, is a so-called padding. So you can add a space around the content, just white space. Uh, so for example, to leave some space uh, from the previous uh, element or to the, to the above part to, on the vertical axis. Uh, so that's around the content itself um, and then you can have a border. So here this is shown rather big but it's just uh, like the outermost piece here you can just add a, a border around it and then finally you have something that's called the margin. That's similar to the padding, it's a space around the element but the difference is now that the margin is outside of the border. Uh, so if you want to draw a border um, it will basically be the space around it. And maybe the best way uh, to look at that is the, the box model example in, uh, in the material for this lecture. Uh, and you will see that I have just done a single diff uh, with a number of things. We'll go into them into detail, but I've basically given different colors to, uh, to different parts of the element. Um, and we can maybe just open that and you'll see some parts of that already. So as you have, let's have a look at the code again. Um, you'll see that I have added a certain margin to the right side. Uh, I've added a background color to the whole box and I have added a border and a padding. And these are the different things that essentially show up here um, if I resize it. You see that the padding is essentially the space around the entire diff here. So it's the space uh, that is within the red area. So basically it's still part of the element. It also gets the background color. Uh, so it's just space within the element. The border you might not see, it's a very uh, subtle line here because it's just one pixel, but I could just change that to visualize it. So if I make the border 10 pixel instead of one, you'll clearly see that there is a, uh, uh, border around it and then the margin you actually don't see very well because I've added it to the right side It's the spacing here on the right because remember this is a diff. It's a block element It should take the entire horizontal space But you see that there is clearly something missing here and that's exactly the margin So I've basically added space outside of the element uh, to make this clearer I could also instead of on the right side, I could add it to the left side. Um, and then you'll see that there is now a certain uh, spacing there on the left, which is 10 pixel. And if I make this larger, then it will basically move to the right side. That's the margin. Uh, let's just for completeness, add some to the top. If I do this, then the element goes down. So essentially, what I have are these four elements. I have the content itself. In this case, it's everything that's within the div. I have the padding, so that's still part of the element that gets, for example, the same background color. Then I have the border, and then I can add space outside that will just be drawn as white space or as uh, space with the background color of the parent element. So these, if you understand these concepts well enough, you'll be able to uh, lay out things as you like. Um, and you have already seen I've used this left, right and so on. In CSS, we'll use these orientations to say left, right, top and bottom. 
Now, this is just a concept here. Now we look into how you actually assign the different properties. If we look at the content, uh, you can do things like the width, how wide is the element. So even if it's a block element, you can say this element should just take 10% of the horizontal space. Uh, you can also do min and max, so you can uh, enable the element to grow and to shrink over time. But you can say that, okay, the element, if you zoom in or if you uh, extend your, uh, your window size, the width increases, but only until 500 pixels. Then it uh, stops, basically. And similar with minimum, you can say that even if you make the window very small, it should have at least minimum 200 pixels. Uh, similar to the width, you can also assign the height, so the vertical spacing uh, and as discussed before you can use relative measures such as percent or em and you can use absolute such as pixels uh, looking at the examples that's exactly what i did here i assigned the width to 60 percent um, and that's also the reason why even though there's only 10 pixel on the right side uh, it looked like there's much more space here that's basically because the element itself is only 60 percent wide now, the important thing is the width here is just for the content. So if you have a border, the size of the border is on top of that. And if you have a margin, that margin is also uh, on top of it. The only thing that's included in here is the padding. So basically you are assigning the width of the content box and the padding. Now, the padding you can, uh, you can define in very different ways. Uh, and the same goes, by the way, for the margin. So we'll, it will be exactly the same, just instead of padding, it will say margin. Uh, you can use this one here, padding 20 pixel. And that basically means uh, we apply 20 pixels of padding on every side. So top, bottom, left, and right. So if you want to have the same padding in all directions, you just use a single value. If you use two values, then you assign vertical and horizontal space. So here we will have 70 pixel at the top, 70 pixel at the bottom, zero to the left and zero to the right. There's also this one here, uh, which now it gets cryptic. You can look up these things, but uh, you can have 10% to the top, 20% horizontal space, so 20% on each side and five on the bottom. And last but not least, you can also assign individual ones by saying, padding minus left, 10 pixels, then it's just here. Uh, and the same is for all the other dimensions. So you can use padding right, you can use padding top, padding bottom. That's the padding. Um, we can first maybe jump to the margin because it's analogous, basically. Um, you can go 20 pixel to, the, uh, to all directions. So if I just do like that, it's again, as with padding. Uh, in the top, in the bottom, in the left, and in the right. Uh, you can also use auto, which just basically tries to align them with other elements. Now, let's look at the borders, finally. Uh, there you can define a number of different things. You can define, uh, you have this shorthand notation, which basically uh, requires you to write three different things. One is how large is the border? How is the thickness? In this case, we have a one pixel border. What's the style? Is it solid like here or is it dashed? Uh, there are other values for this, which you can look up in the references. I actually don't know them all. And then you have the color. Uh, so one of these color names in CSS, what color should the border have? Um, but you can also assign these separately. So you can say border with one pixel and then it's just instead of this value here, you have a single declaration. Border style, border color are the other two. Uh, instead of setting the entire border, you can also just set parts of it. So if you do border right, it will just assign the border here to the right side. Um, and then you use the same values as above. And finally, you can use something that's called border radius to round on the edges here. So that's just the radius. Uh, and again, it's the different corners. So I guess that's top left, um, but you can experiment with those. We can maybe just look into our example. Um, 
So there's one thing I'll get into in a second, and that's this box sizing here. But what I've done here is I've assigned a 10 pixel solid black border. Um, and now we can maybe add a border radius. And then let's try with 10 pixel, 20 pixels, 30 pixel, and 40 pixel. That's the, maybe the best way to see the differences. Uh, and you'll see that this is the smallest one and then it increases in this direction. This one has the largest radius. So the values go from top left clockwise. Um, so that's something else you can do. Um, but essentially this way you can uh, get all the different styles you would like to have. Okay, the last thing that you find in here um, and I honestly don't remember whether I have it in the slides. I believe I don't know, is the box sizing property here. Uh, and one of the issues I already mentioned is that um, the width property in the content, this applies to the content element and the padding, but not the border. So if you want to have an element that's exactly 500 pixel, then you would somehow have to calculate how thick the border is and that might lead to problems. So for example, if you have exactly 500 pixel screen size uh, and your content and your padding together are 500 pixel, if you add a border, you suddenly have a break. You, you suddenly, it doesn't fit anymore, you get scroll bars or something like that. Uh, and quite often you would like to have the width for exactly the element, including the border. Um, and that's exactly what this box sizing property does. So if I use this border box uh, property here, if I declare it this way, then <coughs> my 60% width here are for the content, for the padding and for the border. So now these one pixel on each side are included in the width basically. So that's a useful property when you want to exactly uh, define the size of an element, including the border. And I mean, the example has a, a lot of different things. So you can just play around with that and change different properties to see what happens. Okay. <clears throat> so as we discussed, padding versus margin is basically the space around an element and the space within an element. Uh, and another way to look at that, to, to get a better feeling for it, is to go into Firefox and look at the inspect element property. So if I just click on here and I say inspect element, uh, I'll get a pop-up. And you'll see if you go to the inspector view, well, first of all, you see the code, which is very nice because you can actually change things in here and see directly what the effect is. So now I've added 100 pixel and something happened. Um, if I change this to left, you will see that the element jumps around. So you can make changes live and see whether uh, it's what you want to do. But the other interesting thing is if I click on here, uh, you see down here, if I resize my window, you'll see that uh, there is a picture of the box model. So this actually shows you exactly how the different sizes are. And if you, for example, go on content, you get a uh, up here on the screen, you, you get a, a, a visualization of how the box looks like for the content. If you go on padding, you see exactly the padding. If you go on border, the border is visualized, even though you do not see that here because it's too small. Um, and if you go on margin, you actually see the margin, which is just the yellow part now on the right side of my element. Uh, so this can help you for debugging if you want to know what's happening. You also see that actually uh, because of this 60% rule and so on, the, the size here is not exactly one pixel, but it's actually 0 0.833. So there are some uh, strange things happening. Okay, uh, so that's just an excursion. It's a very useful element. Also when you do the assignments, this might help you a lot to see what is going wrong and where your problem lies. Because this padding versus margin is something that as a beginner, you easily can get wrong. Now, what we have discussed uh, for the box model is about one element. So one paragraph, one diff has a box. Um, but of course, in most cases, you have more than one HTML element. Uh, and then the question is, how is the layout done? 
And what HTML does, or what the browser does, is a, has a so-called flow of elements. Um, and by default, that's just the order in which they are specified. So if we look into uh, this element, uh, this part again, you have, we have h1 and then we have p, and then we have h1 again and p, and the flow, the layout would simply be that this element is drawn before this element, before this element, and so on. So by default, uh, the browser just goes through the tree and draws the elements after each other. Um, and it draws them depending on their display style. So if it's an inline element, it just continues where it currently is. It takes as much horizontal space as it needs and it draws the box. If it's a block element, it starts a new line. Uh, it takes all the horizontal space. There's also, you can set the display style using CSS to none, then it's simply not drawn. It's not in the flow of elements. Um, and now a lot of the positioning that you would like to do, how to lay out things, is not like that. You would like to change things. So for example, instead of having two diffs under each other because they're block elements, maybe you want to have them next to each other. Um, and there are a number of ways to do that, to, to change the positioning, to change the flow. Um, and we'll look into three different ones. We look into float, which is, uh, is a fairly difficult way actually to do it, but uh, it's, it used to be quite common. There is a position element, which is a bit more complex maybe. And then nowadays there is flexbox, which simplifies the process quite a lot. Now, um, just as a reminder, you have to remember the difference between block and inline. So the block elements take all the space and a new line, inline just as much as they need. That's an important part. You can change this display style. So that's the first thing. You can say display colon block, then the element has a block style, even though if it's, for example, a span tag, it still gets a block display. Uh, or the other way around, you can say it's inline. And then last but not least, you have display none. That simply means the element is not displayed. It is not on your uh, browser window. You can also set something that is called inline minus block. Uh, and that's sort of a hybrid between the, th between the two. So it behaves as an inline element. It doesn't take a new line. It doesn't take as much space as it needs, but you can additionally set the width and the height of the element because if you have an inline element and you try to set these properties nothing will change they will just be exactly the same so for example if i take this span tag here and i set the width to 100 percent it will still look exactly the same it will not take all the horizontal space so to avoid that you can use the, the combination of the two now floats are a definition in CSS that basically tell the element to float, to kind of move into a certain direction. Uh, so if I say float left, then the element kind of sticks to the left side and all inline elements float around it. So they basically go to the right side of it. Um, and when you want to do that is usually when you want to have blocks next to each other. So you want to have, for example, three boxes in the same line horizontally. Uh, and you could just, for the first one, you could just say float left, and then the next one will just stick to the right side of it. Um, so if you want to have multiple divs next to each other, then that's a way to do it. Or if you want to have a text next to an image. Let's look at the example of how to do that. Uh, and there's more coming on the slides. But essentially what you see here is a number of divs and you see that I've set them here to 33%. So together the 99% of the width, they do fit next to each other. Uh, and I've set the property to float left. If you look at what happens is that they are actually somewhat next to each other, uh, not completely. And that has a bit to do with the, with the sizing. Um, but if I remove the floating here, then you'll see that the text, the paragraph is suddenly under. So it, it still sort of behaves as a block element, even though it's smaller, there's still a, a line break. 
so the paragraph gets added under the div. If I introduce the float again, it basically tells the browser the next element that comes should kind of be here. It should just be to the next of it because this element is floating to the left side. So that's why suddenly you have this one here. Um, and you can do the same with the two different diffs here. So if you look into that, uh, you'll notice that these two diffs are just next to each other. So I have a line break and then I have two diffs. Uh, and usually without the float, they are under each other. So if I remove this here, then one diff and the next one. Uh, if I add it, then we have two diffs next to each other. Uh, now, this is 33%, this is 33, and the next one is 48. And that's actually why the three of them don't fit next to each other. So this is why this diff ends up in the next line. Uh, if I would instead set this to 33, we should suddenly have three boxes next to each other. We don't, so I probably have done something wrong. Let me see. I have set, maybe it's the margins that cause problems here. I don't remember. Uh, it could, no, the border is included. Um, float left. I do think this should work. Yeah, so now they are next to each other. Um, so you already see that uh, messing around with these margins can already cause the problem because here we have added another 2% to the width and then we have 99% plus 2 is 101 so the, this box does not anymore fit into the same line that's why before that there was a line break uh, so these things can be quite tricky but uh, using the float you can manage that uh, you suddenly have block elements next to each other, even though usually they should start in a new line. Uh, so that's one of the ways to uh, achieve multiple boxes, multiple block elements within the same line. Uh, then you have the position property. Um, and this just defines how the position of one element, one box uh, is relative to the regular flow. So usually you have this, you have one element, then the next one, then the next one, and or they could be under each other. Uh, and you could just set certain offsets to that. Uh, so the default is static, it's just the browser does as it should do. It leaves a certain space and then after it leaves another space. But then you can set the, the, pos uh, the position in a different way. One of them is the so-called relative, where you say that the position should be as usual but there is a, an offset uh, on top of that. So in this case, we have added 20 pixel in the top and 20 to the left. So the element kind of shifts a bit downwards. Uh, so you still rely on the regular, um, on the regular positioning, but you change it slightly. Uh, actually, I do not have that here. I should maybe add it in the examples. Now, the other thing is an absolute position. So that's uh, simply, you ignore the regular flow, you ignore that usually the element should be here, and you just say uh, the element should be 20 pixel from the top, 20 pixel from the left. And I'm fairly certain that this here is a spelling mistake. Uh, this should, of course, be absolute. So then the element ignores the other flow and it's always 20 pixel from the left and from the top, no matter how you position the, uh, the page. We can maybe try that quickly, just so that we have it in the code. We can just change this diff. Um, this is all fine. We just remove the floating and we add the position information. So we say, top 20, left 20. Now we check what's in there. It says, if you use the box sizing, um, you'll see that suddenly the element is down here. So uh, up here, it doesn't care what, what else is there. It always just leaves 20 pixel up here, 20 pixel up here. Uh, and I don't know how much of this we can see in the visualization. Yeah, you'll see here that the 20 and 20 uh, element are just this position left, position top. So that's, the kind of stuff you can do with uh, positioning. And you see that it always stays there no matter what I do. And also if I would have a scroll bar, it would be the same thing. You would still have the element in the top. Um, 
we can maybe visualize that by adding a very large padding to the top here then we should get scroll bars uh, and now you see it always stays at the very top it doesn't scroll with it uh, there is a final property that is called sticky I'm skipping that here but that would for example achieve that in my example if I scroll that it still stays within the screen it still displays all the time okay these things position and floats are convenient but they're also quite difficult to get right so for example if you have a number of floats together uh, there are can be strange things happening you you saw the picture in the very beginning of the slides of this text going out of the box those things are kind of typical behaviors that when you don't get your your sizing and your positioning right that suddenly things happen that should not happen um, and this has been one of the big headaches with CSS and now one of the recent changes is uh, to add facilities that make that easier and one of them is Flexbox. So Flexbox is, uh, is, a, is a technique in CSS that helps to make positioning of multiple elements much, much easier. Um, and what Flexbox does is basically introduce a number of properties for, for container elements like divs, so elements that just contain other stuff. Uh, and the items within those containers. So that's what we typically want to do. We want to have boxes and these boxes contain, for example, links, text, whatever, and they are layouted in different ways. There is a great introduction in, in reference number seven, probably much better than what I can discuss. So if you do not understand what I'm talking about, please have a look at that. Uh, Flexbox knows a number of concepts. It knows a so-called flex container. So you define a container element that contains other things. And within that you have so-called flex items. Uh, so those are the things that move around. Those are, for example, our diffs that should be next to each other. The flex container has a main size. So that's, that's the width you define. Uh, it has the so-called main axis and it has a cross axis um, and that's the things you define, but we'll get into details now. Now, the first thing you define is the flex container. So here we have just a dot container. We basically have an element that is of class container. Um, and the very first thing you define is display flex. So that's just telling CSS for this element, just use flexbox. So that's basically switching flexbox on. And then you have a number of things that help you uh, making this simpler. First one is flex direction uh, row. So in this case, we just tell Flexbox that the, the flex items should be horizontal. So the second item should be uh, to the right of the first item instead of going downwards. So we basically follow the main axis uh, or we set the main axis to horizontal. The next thing is flex wrap. Uh, and that just tells that if I set it to wrap, it means that if we run out of space, if the items are too large, you should wrap around. So they should get go to the next line. Uh, sometimes you want to avoid that. So maybe sometimes you always want to have them next to each other. And if they get too large, then you just want to scroll. Uh, but in many cases, you say that if the screen size gets too small, then please wrap them so it still fits without scroll bars. Then uh, we have justify content. That is about the spacing between the flex items. So uh, in this case, I do space evenly. That means that there is always the same space between the items and between the flex container. Uh, that's a good one. And finally, uh, you can decide how to lay, uh, how to align the items vertically. So according to the cross axis. Uh, if I set this to center, then they are like they are here. So basically the, the middle of each item is, is aligned. You could also define it that, for example, this box ends up at the top. This would be a top alignment. Um, if you want to know all the different properties you can set, please refer to the seventh reference. Um, let's quickly look at the example. So here what I've done uh, is I have a div which I have given the class container. So this is my flex container. And in there I have a number of divs that are all of class item. 
And you'll see now if you look up here that I've basically given the uh, container class the Flexbox property. So this container behaves like Flexbox and I've used exactly the uh, properties from the slides. So I'm, I'm doing horizontal flow, I'm wrapping when there is not enough space, there is an even spacing between the elements and on the vertical axis there are aligned central. Um, we can have a look at that just to give you an impression. Uh, you see that the divs are next to each other. We have four divs. I've just given them four different colors. Uh, you see the, the spacing here. Uh, there is currently no space between them. We can check that in a second. Um, but that's an important thing to note. Now one interesting thing is I have set this to wrap. So the boxes should wrap around. Um, but they don't do that really. And that's because I don't, I haven't set them any specific size. I haven't set the width to, for example, 100 pixel. Um, and that means by default in HTML, the size just changes when I, when I reposition. Uh, they just take as much space as possible. Um, but that's why I don't have any wrapping behavior. If I go in here and I would, for example, say, um, now I have to check. Now I've, I've set other properties. We'll get into that. So this is the container and then you can give properties to the items that are within that. In, in my case, that's the, the diffs within there. Uh, they are all of class item and I could give them an order and I can give them, for example, a growth property. How large should they be? Um, that means a number of things. So first of all, the order is how things are ordered. Uh, here I have order one, that means it's the first element. If I have another flex item that has order two, then it comes after order one. Uh, if I have anything that is larger, it comes afterwards. So it's basically just ordering by increasing number. Uh, and this way you can reorder things. So if we look into my code here, you'll see that here I have my divs uh, and I have order one, five, three, four. You'll see that three is smaller than five uh, so you will actually see that the green one should be before the red box. Here you go. So the green comes before the red box, even though in the code it's the other way around. So this ordering can help with the reordering. Um, the other thing, the other property I have used is the grow. Um, and this one just defines how the element grow, how elements grow um, relative to each other. So in this example here, I have flex grow one, flex grow one, and flex grow two. That means the middle item here will always be double the size of the other two. Uh, and I have done something similar in the code. Uh, you see that the first item, that's the gray box, should always be double the size of the other boxes. Uh, and you can imagine that this is true. So this one is roughly double the size, then green, then red, and then blue. Let's make this a bit larger so that my text does not get out of the box. Um, but this way you can very easily position elements next to each other. As I said, if you want uh, any details on Flexbox, please look up the reference, but it is a very useful technique, especially for this alignment of different boxes next to each other. So this is very, very useful also for assignment one. Okay, so this was what I wanted to talk about positioning. Uh, in overall, you now know a lot about CSS. You know about selectors, combinators, you know about the ordering, the rules. Uh, you know different properties that you can declare, that you can set. Uh, and we have talked about positioning, including Flexbox. Uh, this is all very nice, but it's really tricky to actually do this. So that's why we have the assignment and we have the optional assignments so that you practice this. Because in theory, it all sounds great uh, until you sit down and actually try to do something. Um, and at the same time, of course, this was a lot in a very short time. So you need to practice this.